on episode 21 of New Tech People. Today we've got Jeremy Gupta. Thanks for your time. Thanks, James. Pleasure to be here. Mate, you're new to Newcastle, so most people wouldn't know of you. Can you give uh, give people, give the listeners a bit of an overview of who you are, what you've done? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so not new to Newcastle. I, I actually grew up here, but uh, I've come back after 18 years. Um, I spent the majority of my time in Sydney. Um, so I actually went there for university and then kind of fell into technology. Um, career's been pretty broad. Um, I spent the majority of my time kind of in strategy and consulting at a services company. Um, done some pretty cool stuff with Woolworths, with News Corp, enterprise and government. Uh, really kind of rode that wave of mobile and, and cloud adoption in, in kind of enterprise. And then the last three years, I've been the chief technology officer at uh, Cars Guide and Auto Trader, which is a lot of fun as well um, in the automotive vertical. Um, the second brand, Auto Trader, we, we launched from the ground up. Uh, which is not insignificant, um, lots of peaks and lots of troughs, but a lot of fun as well. So that's kind of been the majority of my career. And I had a stint in New York as well, um, setting up the technology function of a, a new office over there, which uh, was a lot of fun pre-kids. Pre-kids, that's a big <laughs> difference, mate. You've just touched on there. Let's go straight to the Newcastle part. You've yeah. done Sydney, you've done New York, back to Newcastle. I want to bring somebody who's a, you know, a current CTO back to Newcastle. Yeah, I mean, it's actually family reasons. Um, so our daughter goes to kindergarten next year, and so we kind of had a line in the sand, and we wanted her to, to go to school in Newcastle. Great place to grow up. Um, but beyond kind of the family reasons, I think um, I'd seen a lot of stuff around the Newcastle environment and the culture and some of the change that had happened, and I've still got family and friends up here, so we kind of got to see that on the odd weekend and, and over holidays. So um, primarily family, but um, also the opportunity, I think, is still here um, yeah. and, and is growing, so I'm pretty excited about it. Okay. Nice. Mate, you've been in Newcastle for about a month now, right? What's your current thoughts on the, the scene, the tech scene in Newcastle? You've probably got, I know you, I've seen you at a few events, uh, I know you've met a lot of people. What's your current thoughts on the state of play? Yeah, pleasantly surprised, to be honest. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have any kind of preconceptions about the size of the community or, you know, the kinds of things that were going on and, and the characters here, but big kind of range of skill sets and, and range of ideas across all verticals. So um, had some really good conversations, uh, you know, with yourself and some others at, at events. Um, lots of entrepreneurs and early stage companies, um, a lot of bigger companies as well that are trying to be progressive. So um, really promising and, and the stuff that the uni's doing, I think, you know, is really um, important to the community and, and really impressive as well. So definitely pleasantly surprised. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of having both of that sort of entrepreneurial startup level through to a few scallops that are having big success now as well. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's important for those to be visible. I think, um, you know, we're in an event where Newcastle probably didn't promote itself as, as well as it could have, yeah. but it's pretty clear that there's some strong cohorts coming through and, and some good thinkers in the community. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it bodes well for the future. Yeah, cool. And then from an individual perspective, how are you, what's the plans for you getting involved with the community locally? Is it starting your own startup, getting involved, consultancy, where you at, what are, you, what are your plans? Yeah, a few, a, few, a few ideas kind of kicking around. I think we need to settle up here and, and get to know everyone a bit better. Um, I think you know, I'm definitely keen to contribute to the community. So I've, I've been a, you know, with the Uni of Newcastle guys and kind of talked about you know, involve, involvement in that yeah. kind of piece, um, some advising and, and mentoring with the stuff that they're doing. Um, I think Newcastle's ripe for... Um, software engineering um, capabilities that can service kind of more metro areas. Um, so before I left Sydney, there were a lot of there's a lot of interest in um, Sydney-based companies and Melbourne-based companies using a team based out of Newcastle or otherwise um, due to talent shortage and you know the cost of talent in those metro areas. And then I think um, you know thirdly, you touched on consulting. I think there's a lot of opportunities here to kind of I guess advise and mentor and, and build the capability yeah. um, with some of the local companies based on learnings that I've had. You know, across Sydney and New York. Yeah, for sure. That talent shortage is uh, very real. It's very real, not only in capital cities, but yeah. in Newcastle, especially from an engineering perspective, right? Yeah, yeah, by the sounds of it. Uh, I think, you know, what we said about Newcastle promoting itself will help. Uh, I don't think it's a short-term game. I think you're looking at a three- and a five-year horizon. Yeah. And you need to get more people into those um, degrees and, you know, into those cohorts out of, out of school yeah. um, and have an interest in technology. So I think it's the right vision, you know, but it'll take time, no doubt. Yeah, cool. And you just mentioned on it, so coming into the university side, right? You've done a degree. Yes. What was your degree in? Uh, I did a Bachelor of Computer and a Master of Biomedical. Biomedical. Engineering, yeah. Yeah, sweet. Talk to us about that. <laughs> so the Biomedical Engineering sits, uh, the degree sits in a non-framed piece of paper uh, under my bed uh, and it's never been used. 
Um, I did that predominantly because I didn't actually know what to do at university. Um, so I come from a medical family and I didn't want to be a doctor and I kind of fell into you know, what might be medical-esque, but not really with um, dealing with blood and guts and, and hospitals. So I did that. And then um, kind of out, out of university, I kind of fell more into technology and got a graduate role as a software engineer. Um, you know, if I could go back in time, I would have had more of an interest in technology, um, particularly in school, as opposed to just from university and onwards. Yeah. Um, so while the biomedical engineering degree you know, is bona fide and it hasn't been used, uh, it's predominantly the computer engineering yeah, that's aspect. Good. Yeah. Nice. So overall, if you had to say that computer engineering degree in particular, how valuable has that been for, for your learning? I think it's been valuable, like components of it. Um, I spent five years at uni. Uh, I don't think that was the right length of time um, for value. I think it was a lot of fun, but um, you know, value versus effort are, are two different things. I think um, I think three years is probably the max amount of time you'd want to spend in a tertiary institution yeah. these days if you're interested in technology and, and that vertical. Yeah. Uh, a computer science degree for three years will teach you the fundamentals. You might get some industry experience and then you're, you're good to go. Yeah. Uh, I think that'll shorten even more. Um, there's lots of shorter time frame education companies like Coder Academy that are doing six month cohorts and giving you industry experience and teaching you fundamentals. I think that's too short. I think three years is too long. I think you know over the next few years you'll start to see that shorten yeah. and, and universities and tertiary educators needing to adapt. Yeah, and probably becoming a mix, right? A mix thereof, you know, the Coder Academies and the universities, right? So yeah. potentially yeah. a part thereof where you, you mix providers together to get that sort of more wholesome opportunity yeah i think um you can teach fundamentals in a classroom but you actually learn a hell of a lot more on the tools um so universities and tertiary educators need to understand how they can give real world experience to their graduates and kind of send them into the workforce um a bit more savvy yeah i think soft skills are immensely important uh, it's not just the fundamentals you need yeah. to know you know how to communicate you need emotional intelligence you need to know how the business works so that kind of stuff you don't get in a classroom unfortunately no and it's not easily taught, right? I think it's a learning experience to do that. It's not something you learn by a textbook. No, absolutely. Like I learned you know, all, all of my kind of soft skills in you know, the roles I've fulfilled. Um, yeah. I certainly wasn't at a university. So, yeah, I think it's an interesting time for universities and you know, some of them are looking to adapt, the uni. Yeah. But Newcastle in particular, um, it's not going to be a short-term thing though. No. Um, it's, it's a larger horizon, but there's a lot of stuff in the States at the moment around founders and, and VCs trying to get... Um, uh, school students not to go to universities yeah. instead of putting them into these programs where they can mentor and support them uh, and give them a grant so I think you know once that starts to, to catch catch wind over there I think you'll start to see some of those concepts introduced yeah I think as well. I, I think Tim Cook was in an article only the other day or an interview within the last week that come out and said they're a three year university degree for engineers software engineers not worth it yes. yeah I think you know there's some fundamentals you can teach in the classroom yeah it's important uh, I think the rest of it you learn kind of in roles that you occupy and the environment you're thrust in. I agree. I think if Newcastle sort of invest in that, right, um, as you said, three to five years, if you can get more people going in at the start now, even if they're, they've done a year and then try to feed them into, you know, feed them into some companies with some real world experience, that'll, that'll be the thing that'll build our talent pool here. It's yeah, not waiting yeah. for them to finish a three year degree, then get out with a grad role or something like that. It's trying to try to take advantage of them earlier on. Yeah, I think exposing them to different ways of thinking and different environments. Um, I think there's a lot of value in students still going and working in Sydney or in Melbourne and areas where engineering and, and product are a bit more mature and there are some good thought leaders um, that you can learn from and you know experience different scale environments. Um, but there's no reason Newcastle can't, you know, in three or five years, be a place where people want to come and, and students that are graduating want to stay in. Yeah, it's probably getting that more senior. People like yourself that have gone and... In those more senior roles, have people to, I guess, be mentors or, you know, have mentees with you under them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've learned so much from people that are more experienced than I and who come from different verticals and have different ways of thinking or different core skill sets. And it's only by exposed to that kind of thinking that you can grow as well. So the more that we can introduce into Newcastle, the better. Um, in the meantime, I think we still need to expose people to different locations um, where that's more mature, but um, give it time and it can definitely happen. Right. All right, so if you said on that, then if you were to put an advice piece together, hey, you're a, you, you've got an interest in computers, you've just finished year 12, what's what's the plan? If you were Newcastle-based, how would you advise people to go? I'd suggest a comp science degree. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Newcastle has, by all reports, a decent degree. Um, I think 
that some of the stuff that they're doing with Slingshot and, and some of the programs they're running, I think it seems like it's a great environment. I need to dig a bit deeper into it. Uh, I definitely pursue technology. I try and do it with the shortest degree possible. Uh, and I would spend a lot of time outside of university being in the industry, going to meetups, networking, you know, picking up, I don't know, volunteer jobs with, you know, industry leaders or companies that you might want to kind of work for one day and just spending some time, you know, being in their environment and trying to soak in as much as you can. So that come the end of three years, you know, you're, you're more rounded than what you might be if you just, you know, stay at university and yeah. concentrate on books. Yeah, yeah, build a side project or something like that yeah. on the side. I think it's also another really good thing. Um, shows people you've got an interest in it. You can actually go out and turn theory into, you know, something working. Yeah, and yeah, you see in a lot of resumes, it's the GitHub projects or the GitLab yeah. projects and all that stuff counts. Um, it shows that you have an interest in it. You can apply yourself out of kind of your paid hours. Uh, I think it's really important. So yeah, definitely, it's a great, great idea. So I finish your degree then. Do you encourage them to stay locally, or do you encourage them to go get international or big city experience? Uh, I think it's contextual to the person um, and their their interests. You know, if they're really keen to learn, you know, they want to be. Um, I don't know. They want to be exposed to some, some pretty mature and fast paced environments. I think. You know, over the next two years, they probably have to still go to Sydney or the Melbourne or you know overseas. Um, if they're keen to learn from um, you know some of the more younger startups here or scale ups, and they want to be in that environment, I think there's no reason for them to leave. Yeah. Um, I think what's what's important is that they're open to learning and they're curious because they're going to get thrust into an environment which is fast paced. It's very yeah. different um, to the graduate programs and some of the companies that they would have gone into five yeah. and ten years ago. Um, which were really centered around kind of easing them into the industry and providing them, you know, a safe environment. Yeah. Um, which I don't think is the best environment uh, for a graduate. So I think it's contextual to the person, but um, yeah, over time and, and definitely kind of over the next few months, it sounds like, you know, there's a cohort that could stay here in Sydney, uh, stay here in Newcastle, sorry. Yeah. And um, do some great stuff. I agree, man. I think the other part is that you sort of mentioned, may mention over there, the scale ups and startups, like, Joining a scale up or a startup straight out, cutting your teeth there, is going to give you a great nine times out of ten a greater opportunity to, to have vast more vast responsibility, a broader responsibility and deeper responsibility than you might get in a bigger corporate where hey you're put in your box and you put yeah. through a probably more formalized graduate program as opposed to startups and scale ups hey. You've got to get in there and you've, you've, you've got to be doing some work, right? Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, the one aspect of this is getting your hands dirty. The second is, as you touched on, like being a generalist, you know, it's, it's good to be a Swiss Army knife. Yeah. Um, through kind of doing that, you know, I can do like a brand template. I can do software engineering. I know some stuff about product. I know some stuff about business. I can read a P&L statement. You know, yeah. like you only get exposed to that kind of environment in fast-growing companies where yeah. it's almost acceptable and expected yeah. that you, you know, broaden your horizons out of your core kind of roles and responsibilities um so i think you know if you're curious they're great environments um yeah. if you do want to be safe and you know you're happy kind of coming in and, and checking out mentally at the end of the day then you know that's all good as well you know yeah. it's contextual to the person but you know, there's a lot of value in being a generalist because technology changes so quickly um if you just want to be niche and you want to you yeah. know, be an expert in one particular technology there's no guarantee in three or five years that there's a <laughs> demand for that skill set no. or you know you're you're employable hey, i've obviously recruited a number of people and I'm sure you have as well right um, that that ability to learn or ability to pick up new skills is something I'm always looking for right because as you said technologies are changing so frequently if somebody's a specialist in one programming language and that changes they, they become obsolete very quickly whereas if somebody's continuing to pick up the newer technologies work with new technologies shown an ability to learn it's a uh, it's a really good asset to have. Right? Yeah, and it shows they're curious as well. Like they are open and they're adaptable and they're flexible and, you know, personal life, professional life, that same kind of attitude, you know, will take people very far. Okay. You find people that travel, you know, more open and more curious and more accepting of different ways of working. Um, yeah. And a lot of the stuff that people do in their personal life transcends into their professional life. If they're goal-driven, you know, you find out that they're hard workers, you know, if they're open, they love traveling or, you know, they're artistic, you find it, you know, leads to creativity in the workplace. So, I think there's a lot of value in being generalists and, and being curious. Nice. I think that's really good advice. Really good advice. Mate, if we wind it back for you, you did your degree. You obviously, you come from a, you know, I guess a medical family. You didn't want to deal with the, the blood and guts on a daily basis. Mate, what, what took you down that technology route? I actually fell into technology. So it was kind of, you know, the last 18 months of my degree where it became clear that there weren't 
a whole lot of biomedical roles in yeah. Sydney at the time. Um, and you'd probably have to go overseas, and I, I didn't really want to go straight overseas. So I um, kind of applied for software engineering roles, and I actually found a role with a company called NextGen.net, which has yeah. got a Newcastle office. So the yeah. CEO's a, went, went to, I went to school with his brother, and like it was quite odd <laughs> kind of how it happened, but they were based out of North Sydney. I joined as a software engineer and kind of spent two years there and grew with the company, and they were quite quite small at the time and they've gone on to, to greater things since in the mortgage industry and I kind of got in and understood you know what problem solving looks like and you know some of the applications of technology and I kind of I guess fell in love with it um, it was b2b though and that, that wasn't kind of that appealing to me at the time and I wanted the shiny stuff so I kind of moved into services and for a company that was doing a lot of b2c stuff so um, for me, that worked out really well, and I got to learn all the things that I wanted to um, in Sydney. But my advice and you know, how I fell in um, was very specific to me. You know, I think if I'd planned it better, you know, I could have been in the workforce yeah. a lot earlier and you know, learned a lot more things and kind of you know, been two or three years ahead of maybe where I am now. Um, but you know, my early years in the industry were openers um, in a good way, um, yeah. the application technology and power of it. Um, you know, I'm pretty grateful as well that I didn't go into a graduate program as a biomedical engineer. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because you yeah, know, looking back on it, you know, it would have taken me down a very different path. Yeah, very niche. Definitely not very, very niche. niche. <laughs> yeah, three. Yeah, uh, where did we go from there after NextGen.net? Uh, I worked for a company called Heirloom, which was um, doing some Windows Mobile kind of work um, for ComBank and kind of Gordon and Gotch and Baysdorf and a few kind of companies. And I was there for eleven months, but they actually didn't have enough work for me. It was a small team of seven, so I kind of wanted something to, to sink my teeth into and I joined Tiger Spike. Um, so they were a team of 12, a Sydney office. I was a software engineer hire maybe, I don't know, six in that office or five in that office. And then um, kind of joined at the right time. They were very dominant in the mobile kind of B2C campaign industry. Yeah. And then, you know, 2008 was the same time that the iPhone started to pick up. Android came along, the iPad came along. Um, and we're in a really unique position with a good skill set and a good brand to kind of take a lot of organizations and show them the power of mobile, show what mobile first can mean, and then you know, cloud and the rest of it kind of came on the back of it. Um, so I you know, spent seven, seven years, seven months, I think it was there. Learned a ton. Um, that's through Tiger Spike. I went across to New York, came back, and then you know, over time we started to get more into enterprise and government and showing them the power of mobility, which is a lot of fun as well. Um, a lot of transformation stuff and a lot of kind of consulting strategy and stakeholder management. Yeah. Um, but bigger bang, right? Like you, you think about the orders of magnitude of improving workforce workflow and you know, some of the things that you know, are paper based in those organizations. So I jumped into Tiger Spike. And then I really wanted to try my hand at product. Kind of being in the services industry, you kind of come in and you come out. It's, it's a bit campaigny in the way yeah. that you interact with the product and it's still the client who runs products. So I, I looked for a product role and I got the CTO role at Cars Guide. We were on the verge of being bought by Cox Automotive, um, which is you know, a $7 billion revenue company globally. And I thought it was too good a chance to pass up and they were going to bring a new brand down for us to launch. So spent three years kind of building up an engineering capability and you know, getting them to think about customers and new technology and transforming kind of you know, some of the platforms that we use and you know we got a brand out last year which is Auto Trader, yeah. um, which was no mean feat it was kind of like the white whale for that company um, yeah, launching that brand and then um, yeah six months later I, I kind of knew we wanted to be up here uh, for our daughter to go to school and to kind of go through your school tours so that's that's my journey since leaving university yeah wow well, that's pretty massive um, and you're not alone in the, the family driving that move back to Newcastle I think I think that's where Newcastle as a whole is going to get more, most of its more senior tech talent is uh, people that have gone away, you know, learned their trade or, or had some really good life experiences and then from a family perspective moving back to Newcastle because the lifestyle up here is obviously a massive sell. Yeah, I mean, lifestyle second to none. You know, like we live in Hamilton, it's five minutes to the beach, you know, I ride my bike into town. Yeah. Um, you know, it's amazing, like, you know, having family and friends here and the cost of living. Um, I think... You know, it's a bit chicken and egg. You either get you know a bunch of senior kind of industry people, and then you know, others follow them, or you get a lot of companies that are doing great things, and that, that actually attracts yeah. demand. Um, it feels like there's inklings of both happening. Uh, I think a lot of companies you know, are doing great things. Yeah, it comes back to promotion. You know, yeah. I think Newcastle as a city needs to promote a bit more about what they do and and what's happening. Um, but I yeah. I can't see any reason why you wouldn't want to live here. No, I completely agree, man. I think you're right, that top-down and the bottom-up approach, right? I think we're doing a little bit of both. And 
I'm not sure which will play out <laughs> as the big ticket winner down the track in five yeah. years' time, but maybe it'll be a mix of both and maybe it will be, you know, either a big company coming to Newcastle or one of the, the smaller companies really growing up and yeah, fifty you know, person engineering team here. Yeah, I think I think it's a bit of both. Um, you need both both elements there and one will help the other. Um, contribute more so you know we're not far off it's a great city to live in you know we've got family and friends who've lived here continuously we've got family and friends who've kind of moved to sydney and come back for family reasons and you know no one's regretted it so uh, there's no okay. reason no reason not to be here oh cool I mean, from a career perspective you mentioned there before you went from technical engineer software hands-on engineering you know writing code day in day out to cto role um i think that's a path that's quite interesting to a lot of tech professionals on they're going through their career you can either stay there are people that are uber successful staying hands-on engineering and they're just technically yeah. wizards and then there's other people that go down that more managerial route yeah mate what's your mate thoughts or advice to start with oh actually let's go what's your experience to, to start with like what took you down that more managerial route was that by choice or by you fell into it? Uh, it was by choice and, and also being given the opportunity, which I don't think maybe a lot of people get. Um, so we kind of had a, a pecking system, which is kind of software engineer, senior software engineer, tech lead. Um, and I kind of followed that route. And in a services company, the tech lead had a lot of exposure to clients. Um, would be you know, quite client-facing, involved in a lot of pre-sales. And so you started to get a um, really good understanding of the business outcomes you were trying to solve with technology. Yeah. Um, they were also responsible then with the delivery, so a lot of people management stuff, like getting a cross-functional team to work together, you know, delivering to you know, whatever the outcome is. Yeah. Um, so you kind of got people leadership experience by virtue of, of that job description. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I got a taste for it there and then you know, really enjoyed it. Um, I was lucky enough to kind of then assume technical director in the Sydney office, which meant I oversaw the entire engineering org, yeah. which was predominantly um, business and people. Like it said, technical in the title, but you know, while you input into it, your your main um, responsibility is people, yeah. uh, making sure you're building the right capability in people. Um, that people understand the context that they're working in. That people understand business, and then you're trying to understand the business as much so that you can get the right people to fit. Yeah. Um, it's not so much about the technology at that stage. And then I got a, you know, a good taste of that, leading a 30-person team and you know, some of the challenges of that. And you know, I thought I'd do it again on the product side of it. Um, and the, the reason I wanted to do product was for the business aspect of it, yeah. like understanding how product companies function, um, what recurring revenue looks like, some of the levers you can pull in marketplaces and, and things like that. And um, you know, that was predominantly business and people as well. But you know, if you've got a technical background, I think it equips you to make trade-off decisions quite well and to kind of give people enough rope so that you don't have to kind of inspect every decision that they're making and query every kind of suggestion or um, decision that they made, uh, which I think is really important. Um, so I got a taste for it. You know, I was uh, lucky enough to assume a few roles that allowed me to continue to do that um, and really enjoyed it. Um, having said that, yeah, the other route you can take, which we kind of introduced in my last role, was you don't have to be a tech lead and managing teams and people and so on and so forth. You could you know, be a principal software engineer. You know, if you enjoy coding, um, you want to be hands-on, um, you, know, you want to be a thought leader in that space, like that's fine as well. You know, yeah. Some people are made for that role and, and that's what suits them. Um, so we didn't try and pigeonhole everyone into like, this is your growth curve. Yeah. You need to manage people because that's not um, right for everyone. It can be super dangerous, especially in the engineering world, right? Like some engineers are built for engineering and they have passion around writing code and really high quality, yeah. being up to date with the latest technologies and don't have an interest in the world of managing other people. Yeah, they see it as a pain or yeah. a, you know, a distraction from kind of hands-on coding and you need to kind of understand everyone isn't the same and you, know, you can't cookie cut um, kind of performance management or you know, career advice across yeah. people and so you know we introduced the concept of you know if you want to be hands-on and that's how you want to grow and you know that is what engages you then you know the principal software engineer route is probably for you yeah cool if you if people were interested in going down the people management route what you've done any advice for people that's not an easy path right yeah i mean people aren't easy in general um you know people management is very time consuming but at the same time it's very rewarding yeah if you can build a capability in people and you can lead people and you can you know articulate the vision and the mission and set them off to to run at something at pace by themselves and you, know, you see them achieve what they set out to achieve it's extremely rewarding um i think um you just need to get hands-on. I think you need to find a good network of mentors and support people that you can bounce ideas off. 
it's very easy to kind of you know get insular and angry or you know concerned about something that's happened and think it's about you and you know something you've done or said but you know the more you speak with others in the industry the more that you understand yeah. they have the same experiences and the same challenges uh, i think patience is key in managing people um, a lot of things can happen in heat of the moment or contextual to their personal situation you know and you don't always have eyes on what's happening in their personal lives so you know it's it's a byproduct of just spending time in that role being patient you know seeking advice and you know more often than not if you do that you'll you'll make the right decisions yeah and then that you mentioned before the non-cookie cutter approach right like individuals that they all operate differently there's there can't be one approach for everyone right no no we kind of you know our kind of recruitment policy and kind of retention policy was based around people have motivations in certain areas you know it could be salary yeah. and title it could be kind of culture and company brand or it could be like the tools and the projects that they're working on um, we kind of thought that you had to get two of those pillars nailed on um, to keep someone engaged and, and happy uh, if they're just after salary and title then yeah it's pretty hard to constantly fulfill that yeah. motivation if they just want to work on cool stuff and not do anything else it's hard as well and if they're just there because they want to work for a brand or you know they like the location of the office then you're going to struggle as well so you kind of get two of those three pillars and you, you've probably got a recipe for engagement yeah, I completely agree. Man, that's a, some of the conversations I'm having with companies at the moment and trying to attract people, right? You're trying to understand what the motivators are for people in the market. Yeah. What are those motivators and do you align? Because there's no point trying to sell yourself to somebody that might be there for you know, six months or something like that because you just can't keep them. Yeah, and it needs to be both ways, right? Like yeah. Com- companies need to understand you know, what they can offer um, to compete in the market and, and the, 100%. the candidates need to understand what it is that motivates them um, so that they don't try and first year or so yeah and vice versa as well for them as well they've got to understand what value they're bringing right like if a client's looking for something in particular and yeah yeah you've got to understand what value you're bringing to the table yeah i mean yeah for a few years there you know cars guy didn't have a brand at all that we could talk about in market you know it wasn't google or atlassian or canva and you know we had to really sell what we were doing why you join the vision the benefits um you know we kind of said to them you'd grow more here in two years and you wouldn't in another company yeah and that was because we put them close to the problem being solved and we gave them autonomy and we let them you know trial new technologies and get their hands dirty yeah and that that worked yeah you know for the right candidates yeah we said you might get paid less yeah you won't have canva and google and atlassian on your resume but in two years time your value on the market if you want to leave will be more yeah it is when you came in or if you'd spent two years at cba yeah and then you'll be able to find the people that have those motivators that are aligned and then you'll be you'll be fine having those people are but having a clear selling point as a company on what are the objectives what are the motivators that you can provide people to why come join you um being clear about that mm. is a massive advantage when trying to recruit yeah and yeah some companies do it really well yeah. um, and have a great employee brand uh, i think every company needs to have an employee brand going forward you know you spoke about talent being a shortage definitely is in sydney it sounds like it is up here as well especially Uh, engineering space yeah so you know unless you're clear on what you're going to bring to the table uh why you should join yeah you're going to struggle yeah or you're going to try to compete on salary and that's a very expensive (laughs) short way of operating yeah like you can get money you can get people and you can get talent competing on salary and salary alone right there are people motivated by that it's just not a good long-term play no for either so agreed 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 and um, you've obviously been in the CTO role, um, pretty big role, uh, you know, in sort of consultant space as well. How do you get through a day like that? What sort of, do you have any productivity tools or softwares that you use on a daily basis to, you know, get you through the day? Um, I do. Uh, I, I quite like lists, um, so short-term lists, long-term lists, yeah. um, which I segment into kind of personal and professional lives. Um, I don't, you know, have any purchase software. I use Apple Notes. Yeah. Um, but I find it, you know, particularly useful having a set of things that you want to achieve in a given time period. Um, so I have one for a day and, and one for a week. Um, and I have some longer-term things which I kind of bring in, you know, when there's time and availability to do that. Um, you know, I have... You know, some pretty big things as well that you know I probably want to achieve, and I'm a big believer in that. You probably overcook what you think you can achieve in one year, but yeah, you underplay what you can achieve in three years. Yeah. So you know, having kind of a horizon of where you want to be um, and what you want to do and what you want to achieve at a three-year horizon, I think is hugely beneficial because um, you'll find you probably can. Um, so yeah, I don't use anything too fancy in terms of tooling, but I find like short lists um, that keep you focused, and you know, you can kind of. Celebrate the wins when you get through that list. Um, hugely beneficial for progress. Yeah, cool. Um, side note to that, your three-year project, anything you'd like to achieve 
personally, professionally, in and around Newcastle specifically, or your career that you'd like to share? Um, I mean, not, nothing professionally um, that's too tangible yet. I'm probably too um, too soon up here to, to have a clear idea. I've got something with a friend in the healthcare space that we're going to build out as, as a piece of software to help companies align. Um, I think alignment's you know something I'm quite passionate about and sending teams up and organisations to succeed. And you know, my co-founder came up with that idea, so I think that's something will will evolve over time. Um, I, I'm really interested in the community here and kind of you know, some of the opportunities to advise and mentor uh, and potentially consult with um, some of the early stage companies and some of the scale ups. So nothing too tangible, but yeah, I think from everything I can kind of see so far, I think that's a really interesting space yeah. and an area that I could probably add some value to. And, and a value exchange for yeah cool and you're going about it the right way networking's everything right like that's that's how you don't need to have a rock solid idea right now something will come out you have enough relevant conversations and the right thing will come in the forefront yeah i think you touched on it. it's conversations right it's you know you have enough conversations with you know people in that space and then you, you kind of connect a few dots and you know you understand kind of you know where you want to work with and or work who you want to work with and, and where you want to work and you know something engaging will fall out of that and Know, whatever happens happens yeah. Okay. yeah yeah not every good not every conversation is a good one and not every conversation is you know worth your time but no. if you have enough of them you'll you'll have some good conversations along the way and hopefully bring some value yeah that's that's right i'm in, in a bit of an envious position my wife um, is playing breadwinner for the moment so I've got, I've got i've got patience <laughs> Patience and time, right? Time's a big thing. It's the same when anyone's looking for a new job. Is hey, if you got some time up your sleeve, if you're currently employed, it's a lot easier to find a new job because yeah. you don't have to be. You can be a little bit more picky with what you want to do. Whereas if you're unemployed and you're looking for something, you'll take anything. Mm. It's probably a lesser chance that that's going to be a long term opportunity for you. Yeah, you don't want to be desperate and, and making decisions based out of desperation. Um, so yeah, I think you know I've been here about a month and you know, I've had some great conversations. I've got a few more people that. You know, wouldn't mind speaking to and, and connecting with and so you know give it a month or two and i think i'll have a better idea great man great hey if you um continue back to sort of you know what's driving you is, is there any books or podcasts let's start with books any books that you've read that you'd really, really recommend to people that have helped you in your career yeah i mean i've read a lot of books um i, I typically do the non-fiction genre and kind of read about business and industry and i think there's there's some good ones you know the hard thing about hard things yeah. is a great book uh, ben Horowitz. Grant Horowitz, yeah, I think it's a fantastic book. Um, How Google Works is a great read. Yeah. About the insides of Google and creating high performance teams. Um, yeah, The Lean Startup's probably a bit of a, a seminal one that everyone should read who's interested in new products and, and new channels and, and product development. Um, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is a great kind of productivity tool. It's an, it's an oldie, but a goodie. Yeah. Um, so I read that pretty early on in, in kind of my nonfiction reading days, but a lot of the themes out of that still ring true oh, man. it's so common right so many people have read it so many people keep talking about it so yeah, that's yeah. Proof of the that. it's quite um it's quite seminal so i think i think there's some great books um peter thiel's zero to one is another great book yep. um that i, that I recommend um I've got a long list if anyone does want to kind of pick my brain on it but yeah as standouts i probably pick those kind of four or five nice outside of books podcasts audiobooks don't Anything do else? a whole lot of that. I should, yeah, um, and I will. I think um, as I get more time and, and some travel time and, and kind of the ability to, to do it without kid shows in the background and, and so on and so forth. But um, no, nothing at the moment that I regularly no, listen to. But I, I definitely will. Just another medium, right? It's just education through another medium. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense, and I have a lot of friends who do it. Yeah, um, so I will. Just don't have any any runs on the board yet. Mate, if you had to wind things back and give yourself some advice early on come back through what would, what would you change i think you know we touched on it earlier it's being more technology focused and interested in technology um you know i used to play computer games in high school but you know that was about my extent of interaction with it and then you know all through school i was thinking medical 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 um you know going back you know, i should have you know shown a lot more interest in technology um, which wasn't easy probably at the time um that wasn't really the done thing but um yeah we've got a a four-year-old is going to school next year and you know we're just trying to get like everything about technology all the schools i asked you know what do you do with technology what do you do with science so you know going back through my schooling i would have paid a lot more attention to technology i would have tried a lot harder during university i would have you know gone and done stuff with the industry during university to, to kind of round out my soft skills um and i would have kind of got hands-on and you know exposed to some some of those environments a lot earlier than what i ended up getting access to yeah it'll be interesting with kids that are you know starting school 
you know, within the next few years are going to be interesting. Like, they're going to be so well exposed to technology throughout their schooling career. Like, they'll probably come out of year 12, like, vastly yeah. ahead of where most people would be, right? So we'll just continue to change up that game and probably have exposure to things and opportunities with companies or potential while they're still schooling, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, I think we don't really know what the effects of that's going to be because it's, it's quite new. Um, it could be bad, it could be good. You know, I assume it's good. Um, there's a lot of backlash about screen time and you know, moderating you know, your kids' use of technology, um, which I think you know probably has a basis point, but at the same time, it's the future. So you've got to kind of understand how you can allow them to interact with technology and, and still grow and be educated. Um, but, you know, given the workshops that they have for kids in school holidays doing software engineering and mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and, you know, seeing them exposed to those ideas at such a young age, you can only imagine that they're going to come out of school very well-rounded and, and very technically astute. I agree, man. I agree. You obviously knew uh, to Newcastle. Um, and people, I, I dare say there's going to be a few people that want to have a conversation with you. Uh, you've got some, some experiences that people could leverage, right? Um, what's the easiest way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, LinkedIn's always good. Um, so you can, you can hit me up there. I'm pretty pretty active and, and open to, to networking. Um, or you can shoot me a, an email at jeremy at glisco, G-L-I-S-C-O dot C-O. Um, and I'll be happy to have coffee. Or... Sweet. We'll link those both up in the show notes. So all good. Fantastic. Fantastic. Appreciate it. Thanks, James.